Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami A few months ago, someone in the community raised their hand and spoke about how as this community has grown, they have this part of them which still wants to feel special, that they were here at the very beginning. And the strange frustration or tension between stepping into a space where in some ways everyone is special and no one is special. And this being a unique ethic of a Buddhist community, especially one that's growing. Another person spoke about how he'd been traveling for a while and then came to a Clear Mountain gathering. And he said, "I've, I've never felt closer to people, more close to people than I have here. And I can honestly say when I left that I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss them. And from a worldly perspective, that sounds monstrous. But it's how Kali and Amitta often works. Is so many relationships in the world are like entangled strings. You have your in group, those you get along with based on the resonance of your personality. You have the push and pull of social dynamics and you have entanglement. And yet, Kali and Amitta, this word we use for spiritual friends and all of you or most of you will know the Buddha uh, with Venerable Ananda And Venerable Nanda saying, it's amazing, Lord. I believe half of the holy life is Kalyanamitta. Kalyanamitta is half of the holy life. And the Buddha says, no, no, Venerable Ananda. Kalyanamitta is the whole of the holy life. And Kalyana meaning beautiful, beautiful friendship. And this type of friendship is different. It's much more like in an orchestra, if you pluck the string of an instrument and you're in a quiet room and the other instruments are around you, you'll hear that the strings tuned to the same note in every one of the instruments around you will resonate alongside the plucked string. And this is what Kali and Amitta is. There's not the sense of entanglement, but rather a resonance that you're both touching and aligned with the same note, the same song. Our group has very strange karma with leaf blowers. (laughs) I don't know if anyone noticed at St. Mark's, right, or Fauntleroy, right when things started, we had a leaf blower over there too. I think you followed us. So this is a note you can hear even through the world, even through leaf blowers. And it's a meaningful one to begin to value and to shift because it takes restraint to reframe our relationships in this way where we're not aiming for a special friend or for the sort of perfect alignment of personality or judging our relationship by how much fun we have with someone, but rather by the sense of a deep alignment with another. And in the Buddha's teachings, in the suttas, when the Buddha finishes a discourse and someone is inspired, they'll say, it's wonderful, it's marvelous, Lord. It's as if what had been turned upside down has been turned upright 
as if what had been covered has been revealed, as if a lamp had been lit in, lit in a dark place. And all of those analogies are a sense of recognizing something that we have lost, not of learning something new, but of recognition. And so this sense that when you meet Kalyanamitta, even for the first time, there's a sense of, oh, you again, hi, of, of recognition and distance and time don't necessarily play into how close you feel to someone. And what a relief. <laughs> what a relief to know that by aligning yourself with this deeper path, the basis and ground of a friendship, of a love that is liberative instead of endearing and attachment-based is being formed. In Buddhism, we so often talk about the binary ethics of feeding off of the world versus blessing the world. And you cannot truly love something you're feeding off of. So this movement from a love that feeds off of others, that needs them to be a certain way, to just a gentle resonance with the Dhamma inside them is such, it's so much more of a gentle ethic. And the Buddha points to it in many places. There's a couple uh, who is going to be, who's been married in the Buddha's suttas. And they say, since I married Nikula, I believe is the husband's name, I've never had betrayed my wife in thought or body or speech, even once. And I want to know how we can be together, not just in this life, but in future lives. And the Buddha doesn't say to do this, to be reborn together, spend as much time as you possibly can with this person. What he says is, if you develop your morality to the same level, your faith to the same level, your generosity and your wisdom to the same level, you can expect that you may be reunited, reunited in a future life. So the sense that what binds us is not the t amount of time we spend together necessarily, but rather the sense of a shared resonance that we're all vibrating at the same frequency. And Ajahn Amaro had a dream once with Master Hua, the founder of ten City of 10,000 Buddhas, where Master Hua came and said, bright, loud, and mobile is the false. Subtle and indistinct is the true. Bright, loud, and mobile is the false. Subtle and indistinct is the true. But the sense that the type of alignment we're aiming for is subtle, it's gentle, and it's easy to lose track of in the light of the habit patterns we have with wanting a special friendship, one that is worldly and bound with the dynamics of clicks, of ins and outs, of the ways we've been used to relating to people, but this is a different realm. Buddhist community is a different realm. And it's very interesting being a monk and after a time when you hear monks talk about their best friend or a special friend, it sounds, there's something ugly about it. Because in this community, in these spaces, because we're not operating in those same metrics of personality, of how well you get along in social environments, what you find is there's these gentle hearts here people you know in the world would not be popular, would not be listened to, would be passed over and looked over. And when they have this gentle space to grow, you find that they suddenly light up. The word genius has been perverted in Western culture to mean a special kind of intelligence someone who exceeds by many uh, degrees standard metrics of uh, intelligence in this or that field. But the word originally in Greek 
was used for places. You talked about the genius of a place, its spirit. It's like how a swan looks very awkward waddling on land, and you only see its genius when it moves into water. This particular note of Dhamma, which you begin to hear deeper and deeper as you practice. I once asked a Catholic nun named Florence, who I really, really cared about, how she'd stayed in robes her whole life. And she said, after a time, the voice of God becomes more important than anything else. And you can call this voice what you want. You can call it your song. I know a book called, uh, it was a book a long time ago that called it the tapping. The Bushmen called it the tapping in your chest. You can call it the voice of Dhamma. You can call it intuitive awareness. But the sense of alignment at this deep level, that begins to guide you. And that's where your genius lies. And to have a space in a community where that genius is honored and you begin to see it emerge in people slowly and what a gift to have a space where that is available, where there's room to hold those people. But this doesn't come easily. The old drivers for special friendships, for old dynamics, I think we've all seen Mean Girls, or at least some of us have, when I was a layperson, and, uh, and the clicks and the ins and outs groups and the want to be someone special. And then you get a car ride to go somewhere or you've invited people over for lunch and then you notice that there's someone standing over there. Maybe they overheard you and are looking at you kind of with those big doe eyes. And you think, well, there's only, there's not really that much room at the table. I want to have an intimate conversation with my friends. I mean, they don't really fit in. That's the impulse where you push past in a Buddhist community and you are never stingy with the Dhamma. You always invite the person, almost always, not always. There is some balance here. You are allowed to have people that you get along with more, obviously, and people that maybe you invite over more often. But to really notice that closing down of the heart and to make sure you're balancing like, okay, for every coffee date with the friend who you really connect with in this community, are you also ma making sure once a month, twice a month to host a dinner, a brunch, or even just a walk where you invite one or two people who don't, you don't feel like quite fit with you in the same way, who you wouldn't usually invite? And I've always found this, it's just, it's part of something we work with. And I've, I've never regretted that decision. Um, whenever there's that voice in me that says, you know, I don't really align with that person. You know, I, I just want a small group. I don't want to overwhelm the space. Always this line in my head, never be stingy with the Dhamma. And every time it's, it's fine. Like people work out, it's, Sometimes a little messier, but it's always messier in a joyful way. We're far too sterile in this culture anyways. And I think we can take a big hint from the ties and their warmth and their hospitality in this. They pay attention to how the ties operate uh, in terms of welcoming people. It's a broad brush stroke, but I find Thai culture, I've, I lived there for many years, and many of you have seen this at work, it's beautiful. Um, and many cultures are like that. It's just that I lived in Thailand, so I can speak to that in particular. And to really hold up the fact, um, in the Vinaya, one of the things the Buddha prohibited was group meals. And what this means is, as a monastic, if you have a special invitation from a donor, you're allowed to invite, say, one or two people. But as soon as you're inviting uh, four or more, so three plus you, you can no longer do it by choice. You can no longer say, I like you and you and you, and you get to come with me you actually have to give it to an official in the Sangha and they get to delegate via lottery or some other means who goes to the group meal. And this is to counteract that, that source of clickiness and schism. And granted, these are old procedures, but they are based on a deep wisdom. 
And I think we all sense this drive in us towards having the in-group, who are the cool kids, who are the uncool kids. You feel those old tensions trying to overlay themselves onto a community like this. And it takes real intention for us not to fall into that. So can we not be stingy with the Dhamma? Can we always open up? Can you see the person quietly, awkwardly, over in the corner of the gym and go talk to them? This is our duty as practitioners, as spiritual Kalyanamitta. It's worth noting that when the Buddha spoke about the six objects of reverence, he noted uh, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, training heedfulness. And then the sixth is receiving guests, hospitality. And to really take that to heart, when I was at Wat Mapjan, I've talked about this before, but where I ordained, my parents would sometimes call and say, how are you, Nisipo, are you making any friends? And I'd say, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and uh, and I, kept that, I kept that ethic going for about a year. Uh, and then I was put in the, this wasn't completely cause and effect, but around that time I was put in the role of guest monk. And we didn't have great internal communication at the monastery, so sometimes I'd be focusing on these first five objects of reverence, really pouring myself into the practice, heedfulness, Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. And then I'd learned that a group of 30 Malaysians had come on retreat and no one had told me and we needed to prepare huts for all of them within three hours. And, that was, and they would be here for a week and it was my job to care for them the whole time. And as long as that wasn't part of the practice, it was suffering. But as soon as you lean into it with this ethic of love and hospitality as an object of reverence, receiving guests, hospitality, it became this enormous realm of practice. How can I make someone feel welcome and loved? I talked about a monk who lived at a Christian monastery and their rule was that if someone walked into their workshop, if they didn't have a cup of tea in that person's hands, in two minutes they had failed. So what does it mean to hold hospitality at that level? I know many of you are trying to keep uposita days, uh, days where you maybe hold the eight precepts, I would really hold up alongside that. Are you hosting or making sure to feed people or, or somehow bring people in once a month at least, maybe two times? Can you feed people? These are small things, but they're so important for what we're building. Hospitality is an object of reverence and it will brighten the heart. So another really meaningful thing to look at here is the sense as this community grows, maybe you've been here since we had four people in a park, maybe since we had 15. And just that sense of a little bit of alarm as like things grow and suddenly we find we barely fit in a gym and you don't know where you quite fit anymore. You know, before you were foundational and suddenly there's another 80 people and who the heck are these guys, you know? Um, I think... Most of us don't have that thought at a deep level, but maybe it's there a little bit. And just to really appreciate and have faith in the much deeper story which is running underneath all of this. Something is happening here at this moment. The clear mountain, I mean, if you can't sense kind of the wellspring of something moving us, it's palpable. The constellating of bhikkhuni communities around the Northwest, the chance to be part of something growing like this is profound and karma is not accidental. We've all been brought here together because of past causes and conditions and great, great merit. Uh, to be reborn as a human with contact with the Dhamma at this moment in a community's growth is a profound moment of good fortune. And if you have faith in that deeper strata of what's happening, then these small labels of exactly where do I fit, am I still special, am I not, cease to matter so much. We're all part of a much deeper 
song, a much deeper architecture that's forming. And you can have faith that the fruits of what you give to that, even if they aren't seen immediately, they will echo and resonate into your future and into the future of many generations. When we asked Ajahn Anand about Mara, the Buddhist incarnation of death, of defilement, he said, look, Mara, and in Buddhist cosmology, Mara is like Lucifer. He's bright. He's a little rebel prince in one of the upper echelons of heaven, actually. But what that means is he can subvert all intentions below him. And Ajahn Anand said, look, Mara is the part of you that when you try to do good, it says, I want to be seen doing good. When someone comes to the monastery to offer, they want to be seen by all, and there's this pride, let me be foremost. He wants control and pride and ego. And that's okay. I mean, we all have Mara in us. We're all still in his domain to some extent. And you can expect that most good actions you have, you do, We'll have Mara in the sidecar to some extent. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do them. But the, con the Christians have a word called agare contra, or a phrase. It means going against. And this is going against the stream. So how do we go against that Mara conceit? When we want to be special, how do you hang back? When you want to go to the front of the line, how do you go to the end? When you want to jump into the conversation for fear of being forgotten because you want to be heard, can you just not act on craving and let it pass? Watch the first and the second noble truth fade until you're left with the third of a calm, peaceful clarity and act from there. And what you find is that on the other side of that dark valley, and the Buddha spoke about when you draw the mind out of the stream of the world, it flaps around like a fish out of water. So you can expect that when you see, you know, people talking and you feel like they're not paying attention, you want to be part of it. And you feel this compulsion to move and just say something and do it. If you hold back, you'll feel the heart throw its te temper tantrum. You'll feel the fish, fl fish flop around. The raw wound of pride. But if you make it through that dark valley, you'll find on the other side, not just a peace, but a majesty that's much deeper that you didn't realize was waiting for you. And the Christians have a saying that the less well-known you are, the bigger your angel. And there's something about giving our angels room for their wings to unfurl slowly, like a butterfly's, like a monarch butterfly's. And it's so heartening to see clearly that the introverts, that the quiet among us don't shine less brightly in communities like this for that. In fact, there's a majesty that can kind of emanate out from them. I was uh, with a, a seminary named Seminary Satima last weekend. This quiet novice uh, nun who, when I was with her the first time, um, said barely any words, but there was this regal bearing, this majesty about her, which was so affecting. When I went to Canada uh, a few weeks ago with Ajahn Jayasaro, we met a man who had Parkinson's and a stutter. And I think he only managed to say a few sentences, but his heart and his sincerity and his sweetness were so palpable that it's his, his image is one that still is echoing in me. So to have faith that maybe these usual metrics of bright, loud, and mobile, of the extrovert, of getting into the conversation, of making yourself heard, of getting to the front of the line, those are the false. And then if you let them fade for the more subtle and indistinct of the true, the quiet majesty that rests on the other side of going against the stream and letting Mara pass and saying, I see you, Mara. Having faith that there's this quiet majesty and alignment waiting right there for you. 
and that this is really the our imperative as Kali and Amitta is cultivating this beautiful space where we trust ourselves in ourselves to align with that deeper dhamma, that deeper strata, that we acknowledge that we're part of a much deeper narrative that stretches across lifetimes and generations that you don't know but can have faith in the effects of the goodness you do now. I uh, went to WCC Shelton Correctional Facility yesterday and taught to a group of inmates there. And uh, there was one of them named Prince Jesus Illuminati. <laughs> he was great. And uh, just a really wonderful man who'd been in prison for 20 years, 20 years. And he said, you know, it's like anger and these other things are the waves in the ocean, but we just need to stay down here in the deep with the equanimity. And that's where the spirit is. And I thought, yes, Prince Jesus Illuminati. <laughs> that is really true. So having faith in the deeper waters, letting the waves pass, and understanding that um, whatever's happening here is aligned with a much deeper current than any of us know right now. And it is a great privilege over the course of lifetimes to be here at such a moment I uh, count it, apart from ordaining, uh, one of the biggest blessings of my life. So very glad to be here with all of you, and I have a lot of faith that we'll be able to cultivate this community in line with those dharmic notes going into these coming years and for generations to come. <laughs> Satu, 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 Anu Motami. So I think we have some time for questions. If people want to raise their hand and we'll run a mic over or raise your hand on Zoom or type it into the chat. And just one thing I did maybe worth is worth mentioning is... Um, you know, that this ethic of expansive welcome needs to be held with wisdom alongside drawing boundaries. And there's gonna be people and you just might not always have time. So what I usually talk about as a skillful means is having one or two days a month where you can invite a bunch of people over and just feed them brunch, breakfast, a meal, or maybe a coffee date that you have once a, month or twice a month and then when people come to you and ask to spend time you just don't have the time um, some of you might know that great poem uh, where Naomi Shihab Nye says when they say don't I know you say no <laughs> when they say would you like to go to a party remember what parties are like before answering greasy meatballs on a paper plate Something tell, someone telling you in a loud voice about a poem they wrote once. When they see you, tell them you have a new project. It will never be finished. <laughs> it's not that you don't love them anymore, but you're trying to remember something that you've forgotten. The sound of bells at twilight. When someone sees you in the supermarket, nod and then turn into a cabbage. <laughs> so, so at the same time, you do need to preserve seclusion and measure. But when you go out, really go out. And when you pull in, pull in. And then establish one or two times a month where if people want to get together with you and you just don't have interest or bandwidth, just be like, actually, I'd, I'd love to have you over. I have this big dinner once a, once a month, twice a month, and I'd just love for you to come over. And that's a beautiful way. Um, and if anyone in this community says it to another person, now you'll know what's happening. But it's, it's actually, <laughs> but that's not to say they don't want to hang out with you. It's just a really skillful way of, uh, it's a very skillful way of actually, for a lot of us who are introverted, 
that's just a good way of really focusing on generosity. And yeah, so if someone invites you dinner to dinner, it's not that they don't want to hang out individually. It's just maybe that they're really trying to honor this ethic of hospitality and honoring their own time and practice. So you have to balance these things, but um, it's a good dynamic to work with. Okay. Any things people would like to talk about? Thank you very much, Ajahn. Um, when you speak about uh, avoiding the self-aggrandizing extroversion and going to the back of the line, there is a deep part of me that's very socially anxious that celebrates that idea. Um, my concern, or one of the things I've been thinking about, is the idea that I could, I could be introverted to the point of lacking connection with others almost entirely. And that does not promote uh, the idea of being able to generate or maintain spiritual friendship. So I was wondering if you could speak on anything to keep in mind when I'm seeing somebody to potentially talk to, for example, and say, okay, is my desire to talk to them craving? Or is my identification of it as craving actually aversion? And just trying to find out how to approach that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great, great question. What's your name again? Dominic. Dominic, good to meet you. Yeah, I suppose I was focused largely on the extroverts in some ways. Um, I think one meaningful way is to, I mean, it's a bit of guess and check, right? Um, but that ethic of the Four Noble Truths applies in all these situations. So if you find you're really kind of a mess about like, should I go, should I not go, and a lot of doubt and fear, just take a lap, you know, or like go to the restroom or like take a second or go get some food first. But usually you need some space. And, and then when things have settled, you'll have a lot more clarity around it. Um, and then it's not like you just freeze and don't move until, you know, you're clear on what to do. Like, you sort of do a holding pattern. So maybe that holding pattern is, you know, talking to, you're at a gathering, maybe it is talking to some people. But um, making sure to take the time you need, if, if you really are spinning out, to just take a walk. And skillful means, what we call upaya in Buddhism, are so helpful in so many places, because often we get stuck into this binary of this or that. And upaya is the acknowledgement that often the middle path is actually this kind of creative workaround with a twinkle in your eye. So like we had someone, um, you, you can write as like, hello, I'm Dominic, I'm an introvert, talk to me. Uh, <laughs> or that can be your introduction. I'm an introvert, hello. Um, one skillful means I really find, because uh, monks aren't great at kind of, you know, cocktail parties, etc. Well, terrible at those, but uh, <laughs> um, but uh, is, is asking one or two people to go on a walk with you for just, just around the parking lot for five minutes. But like I find if I'm having trouble in the wider group situation, just to like sort of skim by, grab one person, take a lap, and then come in and find another person I want to talk to. And it's like so much more relaxing, connecting if I need that space. Um, so... Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question, but I'd say just trusting your intuitive wisdom. There's not a perfect ethic around it, but just taking the time you need to settle into that third noble truth of, of kind of some, some clarity before deciding. And then just taking stock after a gathering. If you're totally, you know, running on overdrive after, maybe you talked a little too much, etc. So, yeah, good luck. I think we have two over here. Um, I had a question about resonance. You were talking about how you sort of spiritual friends and in Buddhist communities you kind of find ways to kind of resonate with people. Does that resonance sort of change depending on who you're with? Like with one person you might resonate 
with you know on a C sharp level, and then another person you might resonate on a you know a bass kind of level, so that you kind of are able to resonate with everyone. And to to take this question you know a little bit wider, you know in this Buddhist community you know you might resonate one way with someone who's more extroverted. If I myself am an introvert, then I might resonate a different way with someone who's an introvert. But if I'm outside of this community and I'm resonating with someone who just doesn't agree with my points of view, mm. or if I'm in a work situation and I'm, I'm thinking especially like my time in the, in the trades where I'm on different crews and they're behaving very differently and I have to resonate with how they want me to work and how they like to talk and how they like to be. Yeah. So how, does, how can I work on kind of my resonance being adaptable and mutable? A really good question. Um, did you say you worked on cruise ships? Uh, trade cruise. Okay. Oh, trade crews, not cruise ships. Okay. I was going to say cruise ships are definitely a different note, so. <laughs> um, yeah, the... Um, I think that addresses an important part of also avoiding Buddhist conceit, where um, I do find with practitioners, often the note of shared resonance, that, that tuned note is very strong. But I'd say that uh, maybe it's a matter of octaves, you could almost say. Like, maybe you're vibrating at kind of this very audible kind of higher similar note of the same octave with many people here to various extents although you adjust how you the surface level of how you interact with them um i don't know how far to take this metaphor maybe you're playing a different tune you know but like with practitioners often i find there is kind of this deeper resonance that transcends personality and time and distance um even if you're adjusting how you're talking to different people here, depending on what they're like. But I think what you're pointing to with others is, is a really important point because um, there is this danger of getting this sort of Buddhist conceit, especially when you, or practitioner's conceit, like, oh, I'm at this level and you down there, you know, resonating wherever you're at. And that's just death to the heart. And I, I really find an important part is trying to find someone's Dharma language, um, namely the Four Noble Truths. Like, what, where do they find peace? Where, where is their suffering? Um, you know, I, I sat next to a woman on the plane uh, on the way back here who had just come from a cruise, and she's dealing with difficulties with her son. But asking questions is almost always the right way. People want so badly to be seen and heard, and it's very, it's common to meet kind people, but it's very rare to meet curious people. And the skill in asking questions and finding someone's Dharma language, you know, like deep down, there is a note buried in them that is exactly profound. And sometimes you've got to work through their cruise ship to maybe touch on their son and then you can talk more about that and then you find out he just had cancer and was recovering. And maybe you don't even get that deep. Maybe you just find that they love the Seahawks and you can kind of rejoice in like the shared moment of color. But like, yeah, curiosity is, is how I think it's usually best done. And, and I think if you really lean into that, you find people, human spirits are just colorful, brilliant things if you go deep enough, you know. I mean... Prince Jesus Illuminati, like who comes up with a name like that, you know? And the world is so much better for his presence in it. Um, so I, I'd say that, and I'd say, if you're always looking for the perfect people to invite over and to align with, it can become a pretty bleak world pretty fast because everyone's got something a little off. If the primary note you play is loving kindness and Donna giving, that note will, note will overwhelm pretty much every other note. So like, say you don't have a lot of, for the people on Zoom or YouTube, maybe you don't have a Buddhist community around you in person. But if you invite over just a bunch of people off the street, 
from your neighbors, like anyone for, and just feed them a meal. The note of giving and sort of bodhicitta is so strong. You'll find you're nourished just from that. So yeah, I'd say valuing the Dharma note when you find it at the same frequency, when it's not there immediately, really trying to listen for it by asking questions. And then always understanding that that ethic of giving opens up a new song in every situation, more or less. So does that sort of ring? All right, okay. Yeah, uh, if someone was on Zoom who was gonna ask a question, I think you may have put down your hand, but as, oh, please. It was me, uh, John. Please go for it. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not a question, it's more a command because you gave me the best advice without knowing it. Uh, it was a few months ago before retreat and you said something in the around uh, next time you go with a group of people that you normally see or meet just try to go to the person you didn't talk to the day before and sit with them and then the next day go with another person don't sit with the same person every time and then I went to this retreat and I did that all week I was trying not to be with the same person the next day and it's made a big difference in my life. I've been doing this since then. And uh, so I wanna thank you for that. Because it, yeah, now I, I'm with every time, every time I go to a retreat or with some friends, I just go with somebody else. And if I don't know that person, I go with that person. So yeah, that's it. That's all I wanted to say. It was a perfect, perfect uh, advice for me anyway. Uh, that deserves a sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Three sadhus. That's that's beautiful, and it's yeah, really, really a beautiful thing. Oh, to you're hear. beautiful. Well, shucks. <laughs> uh, Juanita, please. Or sorry, Chris. Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, make an awareness around the, the several things that you mentioned about the uh, brightness in the room of the person that's shining the most. And um, it makes me think of all that's golden doesn't necessarily glisten. And what I mean by that is all the attention of our eyes are blinded by this light, but it's in the light that we can see how the light reaches, like the sun passing over at each little coin, if there's a lot of coins in the room, mm. each one gets a, an aspect of the light at different intervals, just like the resonating chord that you mentioned as well. You play that resonant chord on a guitar that resonates through the guitar body, but it's in that timing of that strumming that other things in the room vibrate at their own interval in their own way, unique way. And so that's kind of my question. So someone who's on, who's an ambivert, <laughs> extrovert and introvert, what would you suggest that I, um, that I learn more how to not feel like I have to assert the, um, the light, if you will, reach for the light when, if I can remember to know that the light is um, ever pervasant, it's ever consistent, and it's like when that light is the shining bright light, I don't need to go to it like a moth to the flame to burn myself up. Thank you, Chris. Sure. There's a, um, if ducklings are hatched and they're looking on the ground as they hatch and you create an outline of a mother duck against the light and the shadow passes in front of them, they'll imprint onto the shadow of the fake mother duck. And what you're speaking about around how, and maybe I'm just interpreting, but how we see this light in people and we immediately go towards them as the source, but really it's something much deeper, is, is very much what I, what I mean with this deeper storyline that we're part of. And you can think like, oh, if I don't kind of 
you know, make myself known to this person or have a connection with them, somehow I lose, you know, this dies with me, you know, and, and I'm, what am I? Um, to have faith that there's this deeper strata along which these things echo. Uh, Kafka had, there's a story of Kafka uh, finding this girl who, she lost her doll, and then he, the next day she went to her porch, and on the porch, Kafka had written this little note from the doll from a place saying, from like Egypt, and for the next few years, every few months, there'd be a new letter from the doll from a different country. And finally, when she was in high school, or at the end of high school, a new doll showed up in the door step. And uh, years later, she found this little note tucked into its pocket that said, you will lose everything you love, but your love will always come back to you in new forms. Um, so yeah, I, I just say, you know, like I said, this working with skillful means, um, just the wisdom of letting things calm down so that you know what the correct action is and just taking a break and going to the bathroom or taking a walk until that kind of can settle. Um, but then also developing faith in refuge of Buddha Dhamma Sangha. We're part of a much deeper storyline and our hearts and karma, you know, good action done without looking to result that you think no one will find out about. People usually find out about it and if not them, then the angels might, you know, or at least, at least your heart knows, you know. So I just, developing faith in refuges, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anita. Um, talk about invitation. Uh, my husband and I plan to invite um, community to our house every month. We, uh, Next month will be on 23rd, Sunday. So the schedule, the address will be on the, uh, the meetups meet, meet 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 calendar. Website. Please welcome. We do the walking meditation, sitting meditation, have the meal together. Mm -hmm. We try to invite the pikuni come. So you're very welcome. Th thank you, Juanita. And so for those of you who don't know, on our website, under like events or something, we have a sub-menu called Mita Meetups where there's a calendar you can sign up for and put events and uh, of just hosting people. We wanted this to be a method of people connecting. Um, so please feel free to look on that calendar, put things on that calendar. Um, any event you're gonna host in line with that, feel free to announce here on Saturdays and on the Wednesday Zooms, just put it into the chat and, and invite people. And just, we really want to make much of that. So that's beautiful, Juanita. And please uh, invite people closer to it as well. If this, so talk to Juanita if you get the chance. Thank you. Um, who's on Zoom? Is that jo Joseph or who is that? Oh, please, you. Samchen? Yes. Namaste, Bhante. Hi to all. <laughs> Uh, Hello. Just I re have recently attended uh, ten days uh, retreat, physical retreat in India. Uh, I was known about uh, Ajahn Sumedho. Uh, the teacher who came uh, giving the retreat has done many retreats under Ajahn Sumedho. I know about Ajahn Sumedho. It is uh, very uh, good to know about Ajahn Sumedho. And uh, one of the teacher was a monk from uh, Vatpa Nancha. And uh, um, uh, Monk has shared many stories about Vatpa Nancha and the relationship with Ajahn Chah. Really, it was very nice to hear. And I thank everyone, and Bante, especially Bante Clear Mountain Monastery, for inspiring many people to walking on the path of Dhamma. Let the Dhamma will continue, and may all be happy. Thank you, Bante. Thanking you all. Three sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And about to that. Yes, I was just at uh, Longpur Sumedha 20th birthday celebration at Amravati with about 160 other monks, and it was really wonderful. Um, so that's a beautiful recollection. I think we have time for one more. Seth. 
This is very simple and short, and it's a rare opportunity for me to use my master's in music. Uh, do you know what it's called, the acoustic phenomenon you're talking about? Please tell me. Because I think you'll this, love it. No, I'm excited. It's called sympathetic resonance. That's so good. Yeah. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of other little things I can tell you about if you want to get really nerdy about how it actually works. And Can you give us like two good, good ones right now? Well, it kind of relies that you know what the overtone series is. Does anybody know what that is? It's basically when strings vibrate, they have uh, a series that starts from a fundamental and it goes to the octave and then a fifth and then all these kind of tones that like belong together kind of harmonically, naturally because of the way string is divided. And so sympathetic resonance typically works best on things that are like a, are one or two fundamentals apart. So like an octave or a fifth. Um, so that's just a little more for your, I like the metaphor and I think it could go really science-y. We could get into it. That's I could great. draw diagrams. So if you need me to do that for you, I'm here. Thank you, Seth. Actually, I really appreciate that. Okay, um, I do think we have to wrap up now.